Surely the Lord is in this place. Have you sensed the Spirit of God here today? I trust that you have. First, I want to acknowledge uh, Larry and Dixie Holman, who were members of my first church 50-some years ago. They're not that old, but uh, we're glad to have them here. I'm glad to have them here. You won't get any better praise singing than you got this morning. How awesome your young people are. And uh, I am so honored to be invited uh, to fill your pulpit today and uh, bring you greetings from the saints in Pontiac, Michigan. I want to thank you for honoring us by sending your great young soldiers of the cross to us. Thank you for your gift with regard to rehabbing homes there in Pontiac for the homeless. My wife said to me this morning on the phone, why were you determined to go to Campbellsville Church? She said, I've never seen you quite that excited in many, many years about visiting another congregation. It is because I sensed in your young people <clears throat> that something was happening here. In your leadership, uh, in the adults that were there, a hungering and thirsting for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so that's why I'm here today. I'm going to try to feed you. I hope that there's some shouting, not like on business meeting night, but shouting <laughs> hallelujah. Amen. And praise God. This is my 53rd year of pastoring. Your young people probably gave me the greatest compliment in 53 years. <clears throat> I preached for a couple hours on Sunday when they were there, and I also noticed in the bulletin here that I have, is that three o'clock that I have? <laughs> oh, that's you have three minutes. Three, that's the announcements and time, okay. I am aware that you have Sunday school. Some of you aren't smiling. That's kind of a joke. I'm not going to go through. <laughs> but after I preached on that Sunday morning, I announced that they were going to have charge of the Wednesday evening service. And uh, after the service, they, they gathered around, and I talked with them for a few moments. And they said something like this to me. We would like to hear you again. So... We'll sing a few songs on Wednesday, and then we want you to speak again. That's a high compliment. Anytime you've heard a preacher speak for an hour, and then you ask to hear him again, God must be doing something. The old silver bell must have been rung in their young hearts, and they wanted to hear the gospel of God's grace again. It's true, many of you... Uh, maybe are not aware of this, <clears throat> but there was a time when the gospel was preached from the pulpit and the pastor might preach for an hour and the congregation would begin to chant, we'll hear you again, we'll hear you again, we'll hear you again. And he would have to get up and preach again. Don't be doing that this morning because I'll do it. The truth is, as I travel across the country, I am positive about this. If the Holy Spirit were to die, most churches would go right on singing their little songs, having their little offerings, and preaching their little sermons, and never miss him. Nothing's going to happen here today unless the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Christ, is here in power. He is the wonder worker. He is the one that borns folks again. The truth is, if my poor voice is the only voice you hear this morning, you will leave here none the better. But if in the providence of God, through my voice, you hear the voice of God, you will leave here regenerated, born again, and filled with the love for Christ. I have 
done something today that I seldom do. I want to be courteous, and so I have scripted most of what I'm going to say. I want to be polite, and I want you to get to your Sunday school classes. So I'm going to immediately begin to talk with you on the subject, a single-mindedness toward Jesus Christ. The apostle in the Corinthian letter that has been read in our hearing today said, I fear lest you be removed from a simplicity that is in Christ. That's in the old King James Version, simplicity. The word simplicity there carries the meaning, meaning of a single-mindedness toward Jesus Christ. Years ago, I was doing chapel for the Buffalo Bills, <clears throat> and in the chapel service, two young quarterbacks sat on the front row. One was Frank Wright, and the other was Jim Kelly. Both of those men have come to know the Lord. But Frank Wright, during those times, became a very powerful Christian. And uh, by the way, during that time, they went to four Super Bowls and lost all of them, so I didn't help them very much. <laughs> but Frank Reich, uh, Jim got injured in a, a particular game with Houston, I believe it was, and Frank Reich went in and um, it was the greatest comeback in NFL history. It still holds that record of being the greatest comeback. Frank Reich, I saw him just a few weeks ago. He preached at our church. But Frank Reich, after that game, was being interviewed, and he quoted this song. My source of strength, my source of hope, is Christ alone. In Christ alone will I glory, though I could pride myself in battles won. For I've been blessed beyond measure, and only by his strength I've overcome. Oh, I could stop and count successes like diamonds in my hand, but those trophies would not equal to the grace on which I stand. In Christ alone I place my trust and find my glory in the power of the cross. In every victory, let it be said of me, my source of strength, my source of hope is Christ alone. In Christ alone will I glory, though only by his grace I am redeemed, and only his tender mercies can reach beyond my weakness to my needs. Now I seek no greater honor than just to know him more and to count my gains but losses for the glory of my Lord. In Christ alone I place my trust and find my glory in the power of the cross. In every victory let it be said of me, my source of strength, my source of hope is Christ alone. To him be glory. A single-mindedness toward Christ. Christianity is just that. The believing that Christ is all. Christianity is made up of having a single-mindedness toward Christ. I have no other God before me but Jesus. I worship no denomination. I have no ordinance, nor ritual. It's Christ alone for me. When I say to Miss Pam, if I were to say to her, I call her Her Majesty. That's my wife of 50-some years. I say to Her Majesty, if I were to say this to, you, to her, I love you the most, but there are three other women that I really like as well. I can guarantee you that would not float her boat. <laughs> it's Her Majesty alone. When God would show the wonder of His grace, He tells us about Hosea and Gomer. He told Hosea to marry the whore, Gomer. And do you remember the story? She was a cheater. 
She cheated on Hosea on at least three occasions. She did not have a single-mindedness toward Hosea. You see, the Bible is a single-minded book. Its purpose is the unveiling of Jesus Christ. And pure Christianity is a single-mindedness toward Jesus Christ. And anything short of that is whorish. It is unfaithfulness. It is adulterous. It is a guise of religion. The Apostle Paul said this, God forbid that I should glory save in the cross. The Apostle again said, I am determined to know nothing among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And take note that in heaven there is only one name that's mentioned or one name that really matters. It's the name that shall endure forever. His name shall be continued as long as the sun, and men shall be blessed in him. And men of all nations shall call him blessed, men of every kindred and tongue and nation. Then let all that is within me bless his holy name. The revelation is the future unveiling of the glory of Jesus Christ. And so I say, get used to it. For when we have been there 10,000 years, we've no less days to sing his praise than when we first began. The songwriter wrote, My gracious master and my God, assist me to proclaim, to spread through all the earth abroad the honors of thy name. There is a name I love to hear. I love to sing its worth. It sounds like music in my ear the sweetest name on earth. And again, the songwriter said, Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise. Again, his name is wonderful. His name is wonderful, Jesus my Lord. He is the mighty King, master of everything. His name is wonderful, Jesus my Lord. We have heard from Psalm 72 that his name shall endure forever. Webster's Dictionary says that name is a word constituting the distinctive designation of some person or thing. Name is the embodiment of a reputation, spiritual nature, or essence. And so it is with a name which is above every name and before which every knee shall bow, a name uttered more, written more, sung more than any in all the world. There are over 220 names in Scripture given to this hymn of the text, whose name shall endure forever, and for which we should be single-minded. As we view his name, you will see him in his glorious person, character, offices, and qualities. Through his name, we are helped to know him more intimately. His name is vital, powerful, revealing, and all-important. There is one name that will last when all other names have died out, and that name is connected with blessings. He came into the world on purpose to bless sinners. To bless sinners, he parted with everything. Though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might be made rich. He was an incarnate blessing. He is the ever-blessed and ever-blessing one. Our text makes mention of a glorious hymn, and it is through this hymn that all blessings come. He is the storehouse of all conceivable good, and of his fullness have all we received, and grace for grace. Christ is the true medicine to restore my soul. Christ is the meat and drink to refresh me. Christ is the fountain of life from which I drink to quench my thirst. Christ is the light in my darkness. Christ is the joy in my sadness. Christ is the advocate against my accuser. Christ is wisdom against my folly. Christ is righteousness against my sin. Christ is the mercy seat against the judgment seat. Christ is the throne of grace against my condemnation. Christ is my peace and rest 
against an evil conscience. Christ is my victory against all my enemies. Christ is my propitiation against all my trespasses. Christ is my strength against all my weaknesses. Christ is the way against my wandering. Christ is the power in the midst of my infirmities. Christ is my everlasting high priest to intercede for me. No man is ever blessed until he comes to be connected with this glorious hymn. But in him I am blessed. Blessed is he whose transgressions is forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not charge a credit sin. Oh, I'm blessed in him. I am always satisfied with him. I am triumphant in him. I am rejoicing in him. In him I'm blessed. In him is life. In him we abide. In him we have confidence. In him we're blessed. In him we're helped. In him our hearts rejoice. In him we trust. In him is our portion and hope. In him we live and move and have our being. In him we're made the righteousness of God. In him all fullness of God dwells. In him we're rooted and built up. In him we are complete. In him we have a standing that can never be disputed. In him we have a justification that can never be reversed. In him we have an inheritance that can never be alienated. In him we have a wealth that can never be depleted. In him we have a resource that can never be diminished. In him we have a bank that can never be closed. In him we have a peace that can never be destroyed. In him we have a joy that can never be surpassed. In him we have a grace that can never be arrested. In him we have strength that can never be weakened. In him we have an intercessor who can never be disqualified. In him we have a victor who can never be vanquished. In him we have a resurrection that can never be prevented. In him we have a destiny that can never be changed. In him we have a hope that can never be disappointed. In him we have a glory that can never be dimmed. In him we have a relationship that can never be revoked. In him we have a righteousness that can never be tarnished. In him we have an acceptance that can never be questioned. In him we have a title that can never be clouded. In him we have a position that can never be invalidated. In him we have a life that can never be forfeited. Anybody in this place blessed like me? I'm just getting started. I'm just warming up here. <laughs> Truly we can say the Lord hath done great things for us whereof we are glad. Today's church has lost the wonder of Jesus Christ. The only spirit that can deal with the spirit of this age in the church house is the Holy Spirit who always glorifies Jesus Christ. Some of you are telling people that I believe God, uh, this is what I preached at our church, to be a blesser of only a few. It is not true. Psalm 72 says, this man is the blesser of multitudes, of innumerable myriads of men that he purchased on the cross. Psalm 72 says, men shall be blessed in him. This indicates, I think, length of time. Men have been blessed in him for centuries. Make, he shall make men willing, the scripture says, in the day of his power. How much, how deeply, how long, and how many ways we have been blessed in him. Blessed to the highest degree. Christ has removed the curse. No curse abides, only blessings abide. Somebody ought to say hallelujah. <laughs> Lifted from the elect world the weight of the eternal curse, he bare away my sin into the wilderness. Praise God for this hymn, this Jesus, this Christ of God. Men shall be blessed in him. Don't ever think that the success of this hymn depends on you, that it is in your power to prevent him from accomplishing his almighty purposes of love. Don't think that by refusing his invitation, you will thwart him and defeat the purpose of God. No, no, the king's wedding feast shall be furnished with guests. He shall cause men to be willing in the day of his power, turning them from darkness to light and from the power of sin and Satan unto God. Let it be an established fact in each of us this morning that we are a people who are single-minded toward Jesus Christ. Let's note again that worthy name of Jesus Christ. 
that his name shall endure forever. He has an eternal name. His name is the imperishable name. His name shall be perpetuated to everlasting. His name shall be chanted by the church while the eons of time pile themselves one on top of another. His name has endured the attack of heathenism with the classic Greeks and the power of Emperor Rome. Bibles have been burned by the thousands. Men have been burned at the stake. Modernists have called him a bastard. The liberals have attempted to discredit his name. His own disciples often lived as if his name were but a passing fancy. But his name shall endure forever, so says the scripture. His name will not fade. His name will not fail. His name will not flee. I tell you, as long as on this earth there is a sinner who has been reclaimed by omnipotent grace, his name shall endure. As long as there breathes a chief of sinners who has washed himself in the fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins, his name will not be forgotten. As long as there exists a Christian who has put his faith in him and found him his delight, his refuge, his stay, his shield, his song, and his joy, there will be no more fear that his name will cease to be heard. As long as there is a sinner who has tasted that he's gracious and has manifestations of his love, sights of his face, whispers of his mercy, assurances of his affection, promises of his grace, hopes of his blessings, we will not cease to honor his name. Why should the sinner cease to sing his praise? The stones would sing. The hills would be an orchestra. The mountains would skip like rams and little hills like lambs. And should these be silent, the sun would begin the worthy chant of his name. The moon would play her silver harp. The night wind sweetly sing his name. The stars would dance to his praise. The great ocean tides would crash against the shore, shouting, Thou art the glorious Christ, great is thy majesty and infinite thy power. How shall his name ever be forgotten? It is painted on the skies. It is written in the floods. The winds whisper it, the tempests howl it, the seas chant it, the stars shine it, the beasts low it, the thunder proclaims it, the earth shouts it, and the heavens echo it. His name shall endure forever because he's the author of an immortal book. And in this immortal book, he is its subject. The Bible is a hymn book, spelled H-I-M. The Bible is not about the Baptists, the Catholic, or the Presbyterians. The Bible is about Jesus Christ himself. <laughs> Jesus is in it from cover to cover. It declares him the hymn of prophecy, the hymn of history, the hymn of experience, and the hymn of coming glory. The Old Testament cries, Behold, he comes. The four Gospels cry, Behold, he dies. The book of Acts follows with Behold, he lives. The epistles join the chorus with Behold, he saves. The revelation completes this chorus with Behold, he reigns. That's it. That's what it's all about. He comes, he dies, he lives, he saves, and he reigns. Every part of the Bible, this immortal book, is meant to teach us who Jesus Christ is. He is everywhere to be found in the promises, in the predictions, in the types and emblems of this immortal book. And I know you've heard this, but let me repeat it. In Genesis, he's the seed of the woman. In Exodus, he's the Passover lamb. In Leviticus, he's our high priest. In Numbers, he's the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. In Joshua, he's the captain of our salvation. In Judges, he's our judge and lawgiver. In Ruth, he's our kinsman redeemer. In First and Second Samuel, he's our trusted prophet. In Kings and Chronicles, he's the reigning king. In Ezra, he's our faithful scribe. In Nehemiah, he's the rebuilder of the broken walls of our life. In Esther, he's our Mordecai. In Job, he's our ever-living redeemer. In Psalms, he's the Lord, our shepherd. In Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, he is our wisdom. He was Solomon's altogether lovely one. He was Isaiah's child king, son of a virgin, with shoulders strong enough to bear the government. He was Jeremiah's 
ranch of re renown. He was Ezekiel's plant of renown, the true shepherd. He was Daniel's stone cut without hands. He's the fourth man in the fiery furnace. He was to Joel the hope of the people, to Obadiah the deliverance upon Mount Zion, to Ma Mi Micah the turning again to God. He was the one Nahum saw upon the mountains publishing peace. He was the anointed of whom Habakkuk sang as going forth for salvation. He is the true Zerubbabel Haggai of Haggai's world, whose hands laid the foundation of the church, and his hands shall also finish it. He himself being the dawn of the day when holiness shall be upon the bells of the horses, as Zechariah foretold. He is the son of righteousness in Malachi's dream. In Matthew, he is the Messiah. In Mark, he's the wonder worker. In Luke, he's the son of man. In John, he's the son of God. In Acts, he's the Holy Spirit working among men. In Romans, he's the justifier. In First and Second Corinthians, he's the sanctifier. In Galatians, he's the redeemer from the curse of the law. In Ephesians, he's the Christ of unsearchable riches. In Philippians, he's the God who supplieth all our needs. In Colossians, he's the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In First and Second Thessalonians, he's our soon coming king. In First and Second Timothy, he's the mediator between God and man. In Titus, he's the faithful pastor. In Philemon, he's the friend of the oppressed. In Hebrews, he is the blood of the everlasting covenant. In James, he is the Lord who raises the sick. In First and Second Peter, he's the chief shepherd who soon shall appear. In First, Second, and Third John, he is love. In Jude, he's the Lord coming with ten thousands of his saints. In the Revelation, he is our King of kings and Lord of lords. He is the living head of an undying family. <clears throat> His family find in his death their significance in his life, their example in his cross, their redemption, and in his resurrection, their hope. In this large family, there are many of differing occupations, but to an artist, he's the altogether lovely. To an architect, he's the chief cornerstone. To an astronomer, he's the son of righteousness. To a baker, he's the living bread. To a banker, he's the hidden treasure. To a biologist, he is life. To a carpenter, he's the sure foundation. To a doctor, he's the great physician. To an educator, he's the great teacher. To a farmer, he's the sower and lord of the harvest. To a florist, he is the lily of the valley and the rose of Sharon. To a genealogist, he's the rock of ages. To a jeweler, he's the pearl of great price. To a philosopher, he's the wisdom of God. To a Christian, he's the Son of God, the living God, the Savior, and Lord. He's my kinsman friend. He is our unworried benefactor. He is our patient teacher. His wisdom is our guide, his power our defense, his sympathy our consolation, his approval our reward, his salvation our highest hope. He is the sun who enlightens us. He is the physician who heals us. He is the wall of fire that defends us. He is the friend who comforts us. He's the pearl who enriches us. He's the ark who supports us. He's the rock who sustains us. He is the true deliverer. He is prophet, priest, and king. He is the white and broody one. He is the lion and the lamb. He's the servant and the Lord. He is the true scapegoat, the true brazen serpent. He is my mercy seat. He is my joy and my comfort. His blood is my pardon. His righteousness, my justification. His strength is my support. His promise is my cheer. His grace keeps me. His power presents me faultless. His bond is love and his burden is light. When I fall, he lifts me up. I'm about to get happy by myself. <laughs> when I fail, he forgives me. When I'm weak, he's strong. When I'm lost, he is my way. When I'm afraid, he is my courage. When I stumble, he steadies me. When I'm hurt, he heals me. When I'm broken, he mends me. When I'm blind, he leads me. When I'm hungry, he feeds me. When I'm persecuted, he shields me. When I face loss, he provides for me. When I face death, he carries me home. His ways are right. His words is eternal. His will is unchanging. His mind is on me. He is everything for every elect, everywhere, every time, and in every way. Since he is the way, there is no other way. Since he's the truth, everything else is a lie. Since he is the life, everything apart from him is death. 
He is architect of the universe and manager of all times. He is unmoved, unchanged, undefeated, and never undone. He was bruised and brought healing. He was pierced and eased pain. He was servant and brought freedom. He was dead and brought life. The world can't understand him, yet no one can ignore him. The armies can't defeat him. Herod couldn't kill him, and Nero couldn't crush him. The Pharisees couldn't confuse him. Hitler couldn't silence him. The New Age can't replace him, and the salvation by works people can't control him. He is the keeper of creation and the creator of all he keeps. But what is his name? That's what I'm trying to tell you. <laughs> His name is Jehovah. His name is God. He's the Son of God. His name is Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Prince of Peace, Rose of Sharon, Lily of the Valley, Bright and Morning Star. He is the bread of heaven, water of life, the door, the truth, the way, the life. He is Alpha and Omega, beginning and ending, first and last. He is the resurrection. He's the key holder. Reverend and holy is his name. He is the image of the invisible God, the first begotten of every creature. He is the head of the church, the firstborn from the dead. He's the pearl from paradise. He's the gem from the Holy Land. He's time's choicest theme. He is life's strongest cord. His blessed name is like honey to the taste, like harmony to the ear, help to the soul, and hope to the heart. He precedes all others in priority. He exceeds all others in his superiority, and he succeeds all others in his finality. He is master of the mighty. He is captain of the conquerors. He's head of the heroes. He's leader of the legislatures. He is the overseer of the overcomers. He is the governor of the governors. He is the prince of princes. He is the owner, for he is Lord. Even though he did not put his signature in the sunset, he's still the owner. Though he did not put his mark on the meadow, he's still the owner. Though he did not carve his initial in the side of the mountains, he's still the owner. Even though he did not put a brand on the cattle of a thousand hills, he's still the owner. He did not take a copyright out on the songs the birds sing, but he's still the owner. He had no servants, yet they called him master. He had no degree, yet they called him teacher. He had no medicines, yet yet they called him healer. He had no army, yet kings feared him. He won no mili military battles, yet he conquered the world. He committed no crime, yet they crucified him. He was buried in a tomb, and yet he lives today. All other religious reformers and messiahs come to live. He came to die. All others leave monuments and memorials. No one can find his birthplace, grave, nor one possession. All others write diaries and memoirs he wrote on the sand. All others choose their followers from the rich, powerful, and influential. He chose the poor and needy. All others praise human righteousness. He condemned it. All others seek those who can help them. He sought those whom he could help. All others hold their disciples with fear and force. He invited his to leave him if they would. All others have palaces and mansions and headquarters. He had no place to lay his head. All others say, follow me and I'll show you the way. He said, come unto me, for I am the way. All others claim to be messengers of God. He said, he that hath seen me hath seen God. He died on Calvary's tree, got up the third day in the omnipotence of his power, and there sits at the right hand of God, making intercession for his people, pleading our cause. He overrules all mortal things. He directs the movement of the stars. He rules, rules the armies of heaven. His kingdom rules over all of his dominion. There shall be no end. Here is his claim, all power is given unto me. He came down the stairway of heaven, born in Bethlehem, grew up in Nazareth, baptized in Jordan, tempted in the wilderness, performed miracles by the roadside, healed multitudes without medicine, and made no charges for his services. He conquered everything that came up against him, went up on Calvary and died there, then went down into the grave, and there cleaned it out and made it fit and a pleasant place to wait for the resurrection. Then on the third day, he got up with the army of his omnipotence. We serve a risen Savior today. He's in the world today. I know that he is living. 
whatever men may say. Men have been trying to wrestle his power from him all these years, but you can't destroy him. What are you going to use for power? He has all power. If you try to destroy him by fire, he'll refuse to burn. If you try to destroy him by water, he'll walk on the water. If you try to destroy him by a strong wind, the tempest will lick his hand and lay down at his feet like a puppy dog. If you try to destroy him with a law, you'll find no fault in him. If if you put him in the grave, he'll rise again. If you try to destroy him by rejection, it won't be long until you hear a still small voice saying, this is the way, walk you in it. Let me try one more time, just one more time here to tell you his name. He is peace that passes all understanding. He is peace in the valley. He's peace in the fiery furnace. He's peace in the lion's den. He is peace crossing the Red Sea. He's peace in the time of trouble. He's peace in the day of judgment. His name is purifier, potter, prince, and propitiation. His name is physician and potentate. His name is root. Refuge, rock, redeemer, redemption, righteousness, and ransom. He is rivers of water in a dry place. He is a savior, a shepherd, son of David, son of God, star of Jacob, Shiloh, son of righteousness, sanctification. He's a teacher, a tower, and a testator. He's the tree of life. He's the truth. He is a minister, messenger, message, mediator, messiah, and my mighty God. He's a light in a dark place. He is the light of the world. He's the Lord of all. He is love divine. He is longevity, a lawgiver, and he's my Lord. He's a day star, a day spring, a daysman. He's the desire of all nations, and he's my desire. He's an advocate. He is ancient of days, and he is my amen. He's the chief cornerstone. He's the captain of my salvation. He's a counselor, and he's my consolation. He's a forerunner. He's a finisher. He's a first. He's a fortress. He's a fountain. He's a friend of sinners. He is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. He is the Galilean. He is goodness. He is gentleness. And he is God. Let me hear you say his name. Amen. <laughs> Amen. You've got that down really good. His name is Jesus. I don't think I've ever preached that fast in all of my life. But I know Sunday school time is, time is coming. Actually, I did pretty good, didn't I? Single-mindedness toward Christ. I trust that there's someone here. You came in this building without Christ. Religion just simply confused you. But today, I stayed on middle C. I did not waver. I told you who the Redeemer is. Christ is all. To those of you who know the Lord, I see many of you like hair, like me, something's happened to your hair. Mine used to be charcoal black. Don't say anything, Larry Holman or Dixie. It's changed colors. So some of you are old saints, and you, like me, have seen the church grow cold and, and indifferent. And there's only one reason for that. We've lost the wonder, the wonder of this truth, that God Almighty, in the person of Jesus Christ, came to this earth not to spy out our sins, but to deliver us from our sins. And God has promised to the church and churches that exalt him, that give him all the glory and all the honor. Who wrote the Bible? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit wrote the Bible. And Jesus, before he went away, said, He, the Holy Spirit, I'm, I'm going to go away, but I will not leave you orphans. I will be here with you. And Jesus said this, He, the Holy Spirit, when he's come, will glorify me. And he did it. He did a right good job of it in the Bible. So I know what's happening today. Many of you here have never heard anything like that been a long time. Some of you people who have hair like mine say, I remember the old pastors. I remember the old church. I remember where there used to be a shout in the congregation. It wasn't unusual for people to say, Hallelujah! 
Praise God. <laughs> there we go, coach. Thank you for that. Amen. There was a day when church was exciting, when church was thrilling. It wasn't boring because God was there. I sat there listening to these young people sing today. My heart, I thought, now don't get up there. You know, since I've gotten old, I cry all the time. <laughs> I just get so emotional. And I said, Lord, these people don't know me. Don't let me get up there sniffing and slobbering. Help me to present Jesus Christ. What a great job you kids did. And thank you for singing some of the songs that I asked you to sing. And, and what about our children's story? Now, I don't know whether this was planned or not. Well, I know it was planned by God. But you're telling the, ch the children about a name? And then I get up here and rattle for 40 minutes about the name. The name of Jesus Christ. What? <laughs> So I want to say to those of you who are here without Christ, you don't have a single-mindedness towards Christ. You don't know his name, not in the way I presented it today. I would simply say this to you. You have no priest to atone or intercede for you. You have no fountain to wash away your guilt. You have no Passover blood which you can sprinkle on your lintel. You have no shepherd to tend you, no king to help you. No providence to work your good. No advocate to plead your case and cause in heaven. No representative to stand up yonder and represent you. Thank God I have a lawyer in heaven. I don't know. You're looking at a mess up today. I, I am... A, I, I am such a mess up. Yeah, I know some of you go like, yeah, he's the guy that pastors that bunch of addicts up there. I is one. That's not good doctoral. He's a doctor, you know, got that title, doctor. I, I like to preach where people can understand. Here's the last thing. Without knowing his name, you're a body without a head. You're a miserable orphan. My friends, there comes a day when every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. It's just a matter of time. Everybody's going to be a believer, either here or later. I'm one right now. I confess Jesus Christ. I, I hoist the white flag and surrender. I lay the shotgun down and try to produce no righteousness of my own that will get me to heaven. I glory in this that my God has condescended and in the person of Christ died at Calvary, in my room, in my stead, in my place, and there is no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. <laughs> All hail the power of Jesus' name, let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. I wonder if there's someone here today that God in the power of the Holy Spirit and through my voice, you heard the voice of God. And like the old songwriter, you can say, I hear my Savior calling. I'll go with him, with him all the way. The Holy Spirit has produced in your heart a desire to acknowledge him as your Lord and Savior and King and Master. And you're not ashamed of it today. And you'd like to confess him. Pastor Brad's going to be here. Others, I suppose, at the front. We're going to stand and sing. We'll give you opportunity to profess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And I so hope you do. I believe this today. I believe this today. I know beyond any shadow of doubt I was supposed to come down here. I, I know I was supposed to come down here. I know I was supposed to preach this message today. I, I, I'm beyond any shadow of a doubt about that. And I also know that this message was for someone. You're very special to God. You're not here by accident. He's brought you here.
and you've heard the name of Jesus Christ, and now you know who he is. And while I was preaching, joy swelled up in your heart, and there was faith, repentance and faith, that was wrought there by God Almighty, and you had life, and you have life. And now you have life more abundantly because you know him. Let's stand together and sing.